Uh, Y'all just extend your hand towards Tracy. I asked Sierra, one of our young leaders, to come and pray and declare the word of the Lord over Tracy. Yeah, Yeah, Lord, we just thank you for Tracy, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Lord, that she's coming in here tonight, and she's going to ruin us for a normal life. (laughs) That we won't be satisfied with the normal life. That, Lord, we won't be satisfied till we see your kingdom come and your will be done. And, Lord, I thank you for what you've stirred in your daughter, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the oil that you've stored in your daughter, Jesus. Lord, how she's poured her life out before you, Jesus. And that I just see you pouring it out before us so we can see it. It's going to be on full display today. And I just thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do in this room. I just feel like, Lord, that we would open our hearts tonight. We would say, God, we open our hearts tonight. We lay down all of our desires. We lay down all of the things we think life will be like or life should be like or anything we feel entitled to or anything we feel like, yeah, I think we released control over our lives. Like, release control over our lives because God is in the driver's seat tonight and he's ready to take us where he wants us. And so, Lord, we say blessings over Tracy, Jesus. Lord, blessings over over her, Lord, and I just pray that tonight, Lord, that as she's pouring out, that, Lord, you're pouring in her, Jesus. I just see him double portion over you, just being poured over you, being poured over you. And so, Lord, yeah, we should pray strength. Yes, whoa, in the name of Jesus. Strength. I just like, yeah, let's all declare strength over Tracy. That is a body. We're declaring strength over your daughter. Renew her body, God. Renew strength. That, Lord, she would be able to run faster in this next season than ever before, that Lord, she would be able to go farther than she ever thought possible because it's in you, it's through you, it's by you, it's because of you. And so Lord, we say, Lord, would you have your way tonight? We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is so good to be back. Today is October 8th. 2022, and for those that are going out, it's a defining moment, isn't it? It's a day in their personal history that they can point back to that day they were sent by this body. But it can be a day in your personal history too, hey? A day that you can point to in in your future. This is the day when God touched me in a new way. This morning, Jimmy spoke about, well, he was quoting Isaiah and said that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. And isn't that what we all want? That kind of experience, that kind of connection, that defining moment that so changes us to see the Lord. Paul cried out for that in in Philippians 3. He said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I used to pray that, and then I thought, well, wait a minute, I gotta die first. The power of his resurrection. You know, to the fellowship of his suffering, he wanted a connection with Jesus beyond just theology, beyond just here. Tonight I wanna talk about seeing the invisible. The world says seeing is believing, but in heaven, in, in, in the spirit realm, believing is seeing. It's what ha- Well, let me give you an example. Uh, some time ago, for three years, I lived on a tiny island nation called Kitabis. And, and it was so small, they didn't have a medical school of their own. I was there as a medical officer for the embassies and for Peace Corps. So Kitabis hired five surgeons from China. Now, these surgeons were so committed to communism and atheism, and they were very hostile to anything spiritual. But I had an opportunity to to reach these guys because I knew once their contract was done, they would go back to China. So I volunteered on my days off to assist in surgery so I could get close to these these Chinese um, surgeons. The chief surgeon's name was Dr. Goon, and that was his real name. He's long gone, so I'm sure he doesn't care. So Dr. Goon was the most hostile, and he was so belligerent and loud. I mean, he, he never talked in a normal tone. He just would always yell, and he would intimidate everyone, and it's how he controlled everyone. So one day after surgery, the nurses and the uh, surgical techs, they are in the doctor's lounge, and, and we're having lunch, and I'm telling them about Jesus. We're having a very lively discussion about him. In walks Dr. Goon, 
and he hears what we're talking about, and he begins to yell at us. He goes, I cannot believe that intelligent, educated medical professionals would believe in God. The room goes silent. So I stand up, and, you know, yelling was Dr. Goon's communication style. And it's only right that you reap what you sow, right? So I stand up. I said, with all due respect, Dr. Goon, I cannot believe that an intelligent, educated doctor would not believe in God. The room is silent. You kind of push back on these bullies, right? So I said, tell me, tell us all, why don't you believe in God? So he says, well, I'm a scientist, and I don't believe in what I cannot see, and I can't see God. And I go, ah, oh, so ridiculous. No disrespect intended, but you believe in air, don't you? You believe in oxygen. You believe in nitrogen. You believe in germs, right? You're a doctor. I mean, they're crawling all over you and in you. You believe in a star that's far beyond our galaxy that you can't even see with your naked eye. You believe in a lot of things you cannot see, Dr. Goon. Before he has a chance to uh, reload, <laughs> the hospital is right on the ocean front, and the air conditioner was broken, so the doors and the windows are open. And I, I look out at the sea, and I go like, oh my gosh, do you see that? So everyone runs to the window. They think I see a ship or a, a whale breaching or something. And I grab Dr. Goon by the hand. I said, tell me what you see. And he looks out the window. He goes, there's nothing there. And I go, oh, come on, can't you see it? And he says, oh, all right, there's ocean and the horizon, and that's it. And I go, oh, Dr. Goon, I'm a scuba diver, and I, on my days off, I dive out there. And there's a sunken ship right over there, and there's a Japanese zero from World War II in the cleft of the reef right over there. And I see kelp forests and, and coral reefs with colors so spectacular it almost hurts your eyes. I see sea turtles and, and sharks and manta rays. There's a whole world right there. And you can walk out into that ocean up to your ankles, your knees, your hips, up to here, and never see it. But it doesn't mean it's not there. It, is, it doesn't mean it's not real. you got to get beneath the surface of things, and that whole world would open to you. In the same way, the spirit world is full of color and life and beauty. But if you're just looking at the surface of things, you'll never see it. Dr. Goon was looking with his natural eyes. But your eyeballs, even in this whole world, seeing us believing, we, we are... We are always trying to discern our environment with our eyes. Our eyes even try to manipulate and control our other senses. For example, you're driving along and a skunk runs across the road. And what do your, your eyes tell, tell your nose? Don't smell that. Nope, don't smell that. Or your eyes cannot, cannot taste the fragrance. Uh, they, uh, your eyes can't taste the cherry pie, right? So I, I get on a plane to fly somewhere, and I see someone, and I go, I, go, I got to sit next to him. And my eyes tell me to put my headsets on. I don't want to hear him. In this world, seen is believing. But in a spirit world, believing is seen. And, and we're all here because of that. We, we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, but you can't live on a taste. You need the whole meal, Right? We, we, we need to use other faculties to discern that reality. Just like when I go scuba diving, I, I have to put on the tanks and, and the BCD vest. I can't, um, I can't interact with that world according to the laws of nature on the surface of things. If I do, it will kill me. In the same way, we need to cultivate our, our, our spiritual senses, our... In a, from in, 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 oh, I'm struggling here. In Western culture, from our earliest ages, we sit in a classroom and they cram information in here, right? And we try to discern the world and the universe around us with what we can understand here. And if you approach God like that, you will miss out on the peace that passes understanding. You will miss out on his incomprehensible love. 
We discern the realities of heaven and of the spirit realm and of Jesus himself through faith, through trust. That's what opens that world up to us. We're made of the dust of the earth, right? And Jesus, he taught us to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, I pray right now that your kingdom comes on this earth right here. We're made of the dust of the earth. That your kingdom rule and reign, that your nature and character would come upon us even this night. We want more of you. And, and this is so small up here. We, we, we can't understand so little because you're so big. Just open the eyes of our heart, enlarge our hearts and our spirit, man, so that we can apprehend more of you. So what is in the way of us experiencing God in more uh, dynamic ways like that? I think Francis Chan touched a little bit upon it yesterday. He talked about holiness and walking in holiness. Or sometimes it's... Um, well, Matthew 5, it says, the pure in heart will see God. Jesus is the word of God. And he says, my sheep hear my voice. He doesn't say, my sheep read my word. He says, my sheep hear my voice. I call them by name, and they follow me. The more I have of him, the more I taste and see that he is good, the more I want. It's just, but sometimes because of our Western culture and how we cultivate our minds in school for hours and hours every day, year after year after year, we build this up, but our hearts are so small. And then we get hurt and we build walls around our heart. And, and it, it's like we're, we're malnourished here and, and that faculty isn't able then to apprehend the spirit world in, world in different ways. Think of a person that goes blind immediately. They will start to rely on their other senses. They will listen more acutely. They'll reach out with their hands for the environment around them. They'll test things with their foot. In the same way, we need to to change here, to grow here, to enlarge our capacity here for more of him, right? Let me give you an example. Um, as a young Christian, I, I encountered Jesus as Lord, as Rabbi, as Master, as Savior, but I didn't get this Father Heart of God thing. Because my earliest member, memory uh, growing up is visiting my dad in prison, and um, I have five brothers. Three of them were in, uh, in and out of prison quite a bit. So it was a crime family. And, and I felt right at home there. Every weekend we go to prison to visit dad or visit my brothers. And, and as a Christian, I do prison ministry everywhere I go because it's like home away from home. And I deserve to be there too, but I was sneaky. I just didn't get caught. All right? So... I move up into this little town after my discharge uh, from the army. That's where I received Christ. And I come into relationship with this guy named Bill Johnson and Chris Vallotton and Danny Silk. And they were all in their 20s then. And I was about 20 and they were about 25 or so. And they have these amazing families. And it was the first time I saw what a father was meant to be. I mean, when I grew up, I thought I was the lucky kid in the neighborhood because my dad was in prison. Because the other dads I saw, they were horrible. And, um, but I'm starting to realize, like, I, I'm missing something because I'm reading about his, his father's heart and a word. So I worked in this hospital, swing shift. I got off at 11, and I started going to this chapel every night. And for an hour, I would pray, like, God, show me your father heart. Show me who you are as a father. I, I don't get it. And then about midnight, I would go for two hours uh, and, and do some evangelism between these two bars in town. And that was kind of my routine for three years. Never had a breakthrough as far as the Father Heart of God. And I knew it was stunting an aspect of, of my relationship with God. 
I got Jesus, I got the Holy Spirit a bit, but I didn't get this father dude. So, sometime later, I'm, I'm in YWAM, I'm in one of their schools, and they're teaching on the Father Heart of God, and I am getting so agitated because I have been seeking, I've been praying, I had fasted nothing. There was a block in my life. And so I went to this chapel uh, in the neighborhood, this little, I think it was a Methodist chapel, and the Lord began to speak to me and said, Tracy, you need to repent of your bitterness towards your father. Well, I got so angry. <laughs> you know, I thought, I'm the kid. He was the adult. If someone should repent, it should be him. And I flew into this rage. I punched out the stained glass windows. I pushed over the pews. I made a bloody mess in the place. And I was so enraged. And then I came to my sentence, senses, and I go, oh, my God, I just vandalized a church. I am in so much trouble. My knuckles are all busted up. So I'm going back to the YWAM base. I'm going to pack my stuff and just get out of here. I was just so angry and agitated. And, um, and this other YWAMer was going to the church as I was going out. So I hide my hands behind my back. But she saw the blood down the front. She saw what happened at the church, ran back and snitched. So I'm trying to pack my things up, but my hands are busted up. The staff come to me. They knew I had issues already. <laughs> and they, I'm expecting to get a lecture about self-control and discipline and such like that. And they just came to me and said, they see, they see I'm trying to pack up, and I was going to leave some money for damages. And they said, Tracy, don't leave. Stay with us. Let's work through this. And I was not expecting that. Just compassion, understanding, forgiveness. And one of them was a doctor, one of the staff members, and he bandaged up my hands. And I got these two mittens now, and I'm so independent, you know. But I couldn't brush my hair. I couldn't wipe my butt. I am totally dependent. I was so embarrassed and so humiliated on so many multiple levels. And they had me on a 24-hour watch. <laughs> Two people, in case I did something to one of them. <laughs> it's just, just the family I grew up in. We didn't have, we didn't know how to use our words, so we, we used these, right? So the next day, the pastor of that church comes and goes, Trace, you need to meet him. You need to apologize. And I was so scared. because What's a pastor? Isn't he kind of like the father of the congregation? And I do not want to meet this guy. And they go like, come on, buck up, be brave. Just go and apologize. So they take me to this room where this pastor is. And it's, this was in Hawaii, and it's hot. He has this black... Um, priestly shirt on with a collar and short sleeves because it's hot. And he, he's, he's got muscles everywhere. And tats, prison tats. Not just any tats, not the pretty ones you guys get. Prison tats. <laughs> There's flames coming up his neck and tats on his face. And when I saw him, I knew he understood. And he just opened up his arms. I flew into his arms, and he prayed for me. I repented of my bitterness towards my father. And I had a revelation of the Father heart of God. My, it changed my life. It was a defining moment for me. Everything changed. That anger was gone. The fight was gone. The hostility was gone. It was a defining moment for me. The bitterness was in my way. He enlarged my heart to receive. He wanted to show me his father heart all along, but I had to let go of something in order to get there. I want to see the Lord. I have heard his voice calling me by name. I used to hear in Mozambique, where I, where I lived, this knock. And I'd go to the door, and there'd be nobody there. And that's every few days, I would hear it again. And I thought my team was playing a joke on me. Until I started hearing a knock on a door that wasn't there. 
you know? And then I'm going like, oh, maybe that's the Lord. I moved one of my friends into my room with me to see if she could hear it. And then I started hearing him speak to me, just Tracy, just my name. And I realized it was the Lord calling me by name. So I'm like, yes, Lord, your servant heareth. And I'm expecting <laughs> some instruction. But nothing ever came. And that was a little frustrating. I go like, am I missing it? And, and, and then I read that verse, my sheep hear my voice. I call them by name. And they follow me. And I go, oh, you're just saying I'm your little lammy. <laughs> I'm saying this to encourage you in your quest for searching for him. And I think it's in John 6, Jesus says, I will reveal myself. I will manifest myself to him who seeks me with a whole heart. The problem is we often seek half-heartedly. In the Old Testament, God says, my eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth, seeking him whose heart's completely his, completely mine, that he may strengthen him. So just like my anger, my bitterness was holding me back, what might be holding you back from the thing you really want? More of him, that's why you're here. Before I came to know Christ, in these ways. A soldier told me about this Jesus, this God-man, who was crucified and sacrificed himself, innocent as he was, for rotten to the core humanity. Well, it made no sense to me. I had no grid for a, a love like that. I had no capacity for it. Now, we have all heard, I've seen movies and heard song, love songs, you know, about loving someone so much you would lay down your life for them. But maybe, you know, okay, maybe I could, maybe if you love someone, a, a loved one, a family member, you lay your life down for them. And it, nah, it wouldn't happen in my family. We're more likely to shoot each other than to take a <laughs> bullet for each other. You know, so I, I, I didn't have capacity for it. But I was trying to, and I was seeking God but I was seeking him here. I had read the Quran. I had read Mormon literature. I had read Indian literature, Hindu literature. That was really confusing. Like there's a million gods and they all contradict each other. Islam made sense. One God, black and white, right and wrong. I was really drawn to Islam. I read everything but the Bible. And, um, and, and it was because I thought, I had met some Christians before, and I thought that would be the most boring life you could lead on the planet would be to be a Christian. I think God took that as a personal challenge because now I pray for boring days. I mean, like, God, I got to catch up with my laundry, please. But I was trying to apprehend God. I was trying to see the invisible through here. I was trying to understand him from here. But our, you know, remember Job, while contemplating the wonders of the universe, Job says, oh, it's too vast to comprehend. I mean, the stars, the galaxies, and he says, but these are the mere outskirts of his ways. He's too vast to fit in this little thing here. It needs to come down into our, our heart, our spirit man. This has vastly more capacity than this. And just like Dr. Goon, I was like, what can I see? What can I understand? And even as a young Christian, I was trying to, I was reading the Bible once I understood that that was the word of God. And, and we need to do that. We need, we, this is a gift. We need to use it. But it shouldn't lead the way. And this should lead the way. And with all my seeking and reading and searching, it wasn't until Jesus came and just touched my heart, bang, that I got it. So this soldier was telling us about this Jesus guy and, and how he loved the world. Made no sense. And then she started talking about this, this other guy named Paul. She called him the Apostle Paul. And how he was a villain. He would, he would imprison Christians. He, um, 
He killed Christians, and yet Paul has this encounter with God. And it wasn't even a warm, fuzzy encounter with God. It's kind of like this. You know, we all want these encounters with God, and we presume it's going to be all, come sit on my lap, honey, I love you. Well, that's not how God appeared to Paul. He knocks him down, strikes him blind, and rebukes him. He's blind for three days, and now this brilliant man, this scholar, Paul, Saul of Tarsus, he has this encounter with Jesus, and he's taken up into the third heaven. He sees and experiences things, and it's interesting that he only was able to see Jesus when he was struck blind here. The same as in the natural, when, when we lose our eyesight, we, we start learning to use other faculties. Something happened in his heart, and he, was, he goes, whether I was in the body or out, I don't know. I know that experience is so cosmic. You don't even know if your body's there. <laughs> but it's a way that we can connect and apprehend in, in like spirit to spirit when deep calls to deep. And something changes here. Someone said, I don't know who said it. And it was years ago when I heard it, but it stuck with me. It says, when you see the beauty of his countenance, you won't have to give your life, your heart, your all to him. For they will run away after him of their own accord. <laughs> That's what happened to these people that were up here just moments ago. They have tasted and seen something of the Lord, and in comparison to what the world has to offer, it's nothing. You think of Paul, for a man of his day, he had it made. He, he had the high priest endorsement. He was trained under Gamaliel, which Acts chapter 5 says was the wisest man in all of Israel. He was a Roman citizen when Rome ruled the world. He had wealth and position and power. He was a ze zealous for the things of God, but in the wrong way. He has this encounter with Jesus, and he goes, I consider it all loss. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost. And that word is, is a voluntarily letting go of things. And we heard it earlier today. You know, or, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Think of that every diamond in every diamond mind. Every ounce of gold in every gold mine, every, every priceless jewel. Think of every acre of beachfront real estate throughout the world. Every barrel of oil, including all the oil we're not using right now. <laughs> There's lots of it. I don't know that we have that much gold in Fort Knotts, but we have oil. Think of that pearl of great price or that priceless work of art. Think of every pirate's treasure buried in the deep blue sea and add it all together. It cannot purchase one soul. When that revelation dawns upon you, not just... The, the worth of your soul in, in heaven's perspective, it changes you. That the person sitting next to you is so valued that heaven in all its glory and beauty and splendor and majesty, all heaven stops to rejoice when one sinner repents. These people up here just moments ago, they've caught a revelation of that and they're willing to let go of the things, the transitory things, the trinkets of this world for a treasure that will not rust, rust, rot, or mold. They're making an exchange. I think of Paul. He was beaten. He was flogged. He was whipped with a cat of nine tails five times. He was shipwrecked and imprisoned and maligned. He was deserted, 
And when he recounts all the things that he suffered, he recounts them in, in 2 Corinthians 4, and he sums it all up, and he calls it light momentary afflictions. <laughs> Are you kidding me? We call it religious persecution. We call it victimization, PTSD. We call it racism. He was a cross-cultural missionary, right? He calls it light momentary affliction. Paul called it joy. He said, rejoice when you encounter trials of many kinds. They're testing our faith. They're making it grow. Paul says, we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. I know a little bit about this. I've been overseas now in third world countries, communist countries, Muslim countries, for uh, I think 38 years now. Altogether, I think 67 countries. Some for just a few days. In my early years, I, I, was, I loved the Lord, I loved the Word, but I didn't really know that much. But I had a strong back, so I smuggled Bibles into communist and Muslim countries. And, gosh, it, it's, sometimes it's been a bit of a rough ride. I've been through seven coups, countless riots, four revolutions. I was hostage to communist guerrillas for five months. I've been kicked out of a few countries. I've been hospitalized three times in third world countries. I've got 47 inches of scars underneath this. I've puked my guts out. I've had malaria, I don't know, 40 times. I've had 12 missionary companions that have died overseas. Only one by natural causes. Her gallbladder blew out. The others were murdered. There's times when, when you really struggle, but it's in those times that you find Jesus in ways you'll never find in the comfort of your lazy boy. He is worthy. We sing it, but do we know it? He is worthy. Do you think if... Paul could come back and do it all again, would he? He would a thousand times. There was times he says, I was hungry, I was naked, I despised of life itself. But if he adds it all up, it's light momentary afflictions compared to the glory that is to come. And it's not just the glory that is to come, it's those opportunities when you hear him calling you by name. I, I don't experience it that that here when I'm in the States. I'm not saying some don't. I'm sure they do, but I'm too comfortable here. And I, I go like, Jesus, I want to be with you. Well, to be with him, he's out doing things. His manifest presence. I, I once, I was driving from South Africa to Zimbabwe, and I had this um, used white Land Rover that, that I had bought in South Africa. I got to get it across the border. I had paid all the fees, but I know the border guards are going to want to bribe, and I will not pay bribes. Wrong kingdom. I'm not going to do it. I mean, I know some organizations call it gratuities, but I guess wrong kingdom. That's not why I'm here. So, but I am sneaky, right? <laughs> So I buy this ambulance uniform from a uniform shop, and I take some red duct tape, and I tape a red cross on my door of this white Land Rover. So I look like an ambulance, and I think I could talk my way in across the border then. Well, just a little bit before I get to the Mozambican border, I'm, I'm on a highway, I'm going 100 kilometers an hour, uh, 60 miles an hour. And I'm right behind this little mini bus, and it gets a flat, loses control, and it rolls. There were two moms in the front of the bus with their babies in their arms, and I saw them fly through the windscreen, through the air, tumble, tumble. They never let go of those babies. On the ground, the bus rolls. People are going out the windows. It was just catastrophic. And it, 
It, it stopped on the median. It was a busy highway. People were stopping to help. And because it looks like I'm in an ambulance, <laughs> they're all looking to me for something to do, you know? And I don't even have a Band-Aid in that thing. <laughs> so I go into full medical mode, and I just go like, you, you guys go up there, stop traffic. You go down there. I didn't want others to crash, too. You guys, you call ambulances. We're about an hour outside of town. We need a lot of ambulances out here. There were about, I think, 17 people. Five traumatic head injuries. Now, I first went up to the two ladies with, with babies. Um, both their heads were caved in. One, their eyeball was out on her cheek. Her head was turned around. She's lying on her back, but her face is in the dirt. And just as I get to them, this other, this, this black South African woman is crawling up on her elbow. She has a compound fracture in her leg. She's bleeding out. She grabs those babies. The babies were okay, but they're being suffocated by their moms. She grabs them out of their arms, throws up her blouse, and starts to breastfeed them. And I go, oh, do you know these women? And she goes, no, I'm just trying to help. I'll never forget it. So the one with her head, her neck broken, no pulse, no respiration. There was a shirt on the ground. I threw it over her face. A, a white offer consul lady is the first uh, to stop. She goes, can I help? But they don't want to touch the black Africans because of HIV and blood, and they're afraid. And, and there's not a whole lot you can do if you don't touch them, right? But in South Africa, so many have grown up in church, white and black, and I says, do you believe in God? Yes, I'll go, well, just stay here, pray over these women, uh, pray over them, and pray that no one else dies. I wasn't even thinking of praying to raise the dead. You know, I had prayed for so many dead people, none of them raised up. So I wasn't even, I, like, I had given up on that. <laughs> just saying. And... Um, and so I'm going from one to the other to troubleshoot. I go like, just, just stay here because other people will come and try to help this woman, and they can't. She's gone. About uh, a few minutes later, I'm about 20 feet away, and she starts calling out to me. She says, sister, they called nurses sisters there, come over here, help us. And, and I go, no, she's dead. And everyone's looking to me because I'm shouting instructions to, to people. And I go, no, she's dead. Just then, she says, no, she's alive again. And she sits up, and she still has the shirt on her head. And her head turns around. We all freak out and start screaming. <laughs> I, I'm okay with dead people and live people, but in between, it freaks me out. <laughs> it, it's creepy. There were people running away, and I wanted to be one of them. But I'm curious, too. So I kind of run over there, and I grab the shirt and jump back. And she was coughing up blood. Her eye was back in her socket, and she was alive again. So I, everyone sees this, because a lot of people stop to help. And I go, like, pray for your patience. Pray for your patience. And people just started getting healed like popcorn. Hallelujah. I was, the ambulances finally came. They took the women in, uh, one of them. I almost wanted to follow them back to town, but it was an hour's drive, and I go, I'm going to get picked up for cha ambulance chasing. I'm already a day late in getting back to Mozambique. They're going to be worried about me. So I drive up through, <laughs> through the border, expecting hassle from the, um, the guards there, the custom guards, and they see the blood all over me. And they go, oh, sister, are you okay? And they go, yeah, it's not my blood. It was someone else. You know, it was just on the way. And they go, you may go, ma'am. You may go. And they ushered me through. <laughs> In 2019... We went through two class four cyclones just one month apart. When I got into this region of Mozambique, I just, it's, it's the middle of Mozambique, and I just felt God say, settle here. I would, had been working in the tribal groups for years. I lived in tents, and we would do evangelism and church planting in, in the various villages there, and I was moving steadily farther into the deeper part of the country. 
So my interpreter and I, we, I, go, I think we need to pray over this region. So we drove around, we, we, we hiked through the mountains there, and uh, I, I just felt to pray and anoint the land with oil, which is very tricky to do in a country where there's extreme poverty. You just don't go pouring oil out, you know, when people are hungry. So we had to be very discreet, just, you know. <laughs> and it was over about a 50-mile area. Forgot all about it. Some years later... After we had bought land and built clinics and schools and housing and, and got ourselves established there, this cyclone is blowing through, makes a direct hit, but it comes up the coast through about three hours inland to Mozambique, hits that mark, jumps over us, and continues on through Mozambique and into Zimbabwe. And we still lost about one in four houses there. Now, the houses are like thatch houses and, and mud huts and such. But our area was really preserved. And so for the next year, we were able to render disaster relief to the villages from, from our location. And it was just awesome how God just covered us. And, and he does that. And I, just whether it's, there's times when, when you're sick and you pray and God heals you and times it just doesn't happen. And, but God is God. And, and you, you become comfortable in the mystery of it all. Now, if you're like me, I, I tend to live maybe too much out of here. I want to understand so desperately. You know why? Because I want to control it. That's why I want to understand so I can manipulate it and control it and steer it a bit. But I've become more comfortable and just relaxing and saying, God, do what you do. I'll love you no matter what happens. I've seen enough. I've experienced enough to know that you're good no matter what. I'm not going to let my circumstances define my theology about you and your goodness. I'm going to let your word define you. I'm going to believe in that. And see, what happened when you know, we have a lot of death and disease. It's a third world environment. And it's, it's tro a lot of tropical illnesses there. And, and I would pray for those who died because I've read it in the word. And, but I got discouraged and I gave up. And I began to let my experience define what I believed instead of the word of God. And so since then, I just go like, I am going to believe this. I'm going to believe God's word, his written word, and of course, his spoken word. Sometimes we're, we're easily overwhelmed by the circumstances around us. And sometimes we just got to close our eyes because our eyes can distract us. Like, why don't we do that right now? Close your eyes. And think back to that moment in your life when your heart first realized and felt that you were truly seen and deeply loved by God. Remember that day, some... For some of you, it was a sudden thing. For some of you, you grew up in a Christian home. You don't even know that day that, that you surrendered more fully to the Lord. Maybe it was another time, an epiphany, when, when your heart connected to his in a special way, a defining moment that you were never the same again. So what does this have to do with world mandate? I have found, you know, I, in my younger years, I was in YWAM for about 10 years. And in our culture, we would always share our testimonies with one another. And it used to really astound me when I would hear someone say, well, the first time I got saved, blah, 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 blah. And the second time I got saved. And the third time, like, they would backslide. They would lose their faith. And then they would recycle and come back to the Lord. And I'd go like... How can that be? I had such a dramatic encounter with Jesus on my bunk in my army barracks one night when somehow this got short-circuited, when that soldier 
began to speak of, of the beauty and the color and the wonder of God's love. And somehow Jesus just like came into the room and he got between the cracks in the walls around my heart and touched me. And with all my searching and reading, I could not find God until he just, I felt his acceptance knowing I was unworthy. He didn't come to me as a judge to, to condemn and sentence me, though I richly deserved it. He just came and like wrapped his love around me and I was able to just like sit on his lap and lean between his shoulders and feel his unconditional love. It wrecked me. I was 18. I went into the army when I was 17. I was a runaway. Showed up at my mom's house one day with an army recruiter so she would sign me in. I went into military intelligence. I was slated to go to be one of the first women chosen to go to West Point when they were just opening it up for women. It was my dream. It was my goal. But when Jesus touched my heart, it meant nothing to me anymore. I didn't care. And then, what about world mandate? Freely you've received, freely give. I couldn't help it. I went door to door throughout my barracks to tell the other soldiers about this Jesus. I was so annoying. I had all zeal and no wisdom. And I, I would wait until they would go into the latrine and slide tracks under the door. I got, I got a good 15 seconds, you know. I couldn't comprehend how they weren't just streaming in. I forgot how I wasn't just days before. But bit by bit, it took root. They began to have encounters with Jesus, too. We were in a period of training. We're being taught like 101 ways to kill people. You know, M16s, hand grenade launchers. It was so much fun. <laughs> Blowing things up, poisoning. It was a, sneaky ways, loud ways. But suddenly, we're reading the word, and we're, we're full of God's love. We're learning to love one another. And then we read about loving our enemies. And so we put our M16s down. We didn't want to go to the range anymore. That got us into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, when you're pursuing God, it, it provokes some pushback, doesn't it? Paul knew all about it. He had a lot of pushback. So did Jesus. But the thing is, when you encounter Jesus, and I, I know this is probably a word that's getting worn out these days, but the people I knew that encountered him, they didn't backslide. They didn't have testimonies like the first time I got saved, the second time I got saved. It changes you. And even in your darkest night, you have a history with God. And you're compelled to share it with others. You can't, it's, it's, it's like that his spirit fills you up and it bubbles up and out and wants to express itself to God and it just splashes on anyone nearby. Sometimes, you know, there's this, you, you, we're, we're so independent, you know, we're Americans. <laughs> We're independent, we're self -suffering. We even have this declaration of independence, right? One of the first things the Lord had me do as a young Christian was write a declaration of dependence upon him to, to break that independent me first, me only kind of attitude. And then to develop interdependence with my brothers and sisters around me. And to realize it's not all about me. And I, I just look at those times when Jesus pours out his spirit in the Bible. Think of Pentecost. Remember that? Or even before that, Jesus is raised from the dead again. He's on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
speaking to his disciples, giving them his great commission. They already knew about the great commandment, about love God, love one another, and marry it up with the great commission. And when he's speaking to them, and I think it's in 1 Corinthians around chapter 15, it says, and Jesus appeared to 500 disciples at the same time. Some theologians think that was on the Mount of Olives before he ascends to heaven. And he says, go into all the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And he's commissioning them. He doesn't just say the guys only and not the girls or the old only and not the young. Everyone that could hear him, hear his voice, was commissioned that day to go into all the world. As he's floating into heaven, had to be awesome. Okay? Poof, he disappears. Two angels appear and say, get to it. So they run off to, um, it's Pentecost time, the feast time, um, to Jerusalem. And they're together with one accord. Only 120 are left if there was 500 there. 380 went back to life as usual. We never hear of them again. They saw Jesus. But they got distracted with the feast and the things of the world. We don't know what happened to them. But there's 120 for 10 days contending, praying. They, they're all in. And it's in that corporate environment when we come together that the Holy Spirit comes. A loud rushing wind, flames of tongue upon their head. We need those corporate events too. When Jesus comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, they're baptized in the Spirit. He could have had the crowds all speak Aramaic. Instead, he gives them the languages of the nations to go out to go back to Rome where they came from and and Syrophoenicia to go back and spread the gospel. What has he given you? What have you freely received that you yet to freely give? If you keep it, if you don't share it, it's kind of starts to dry up. It's like the Dead Sea. Everything goes in, nothing comes out. Pretty soon it's a Dead Sea. But as you share it, it multiplies. It grows. So we have the world's, the world mandate. It's God's mandate. It's the Great Commission, right? It's not the worldly mandate. All right? (laughs) That's Satan's mandate. He has one too. The worldly mandate. And Francis Chan spoke about that yesterday, how it tries to poison our minds, change our values, desensitize us to what is holy and sacred and right. I want to train my senses to discern him. In the Old Testament, it says that David trained his fingers for warfare. That's what our worship leaders do. They train their fingers. Kind of looks like this, right? Or, or like this. Warfare. But training our inner man, our spirit man, to, to be able to connect with a spiritual reality that is more real than this one. Jesus in his resurrected body would turn and walk right through a wall into the room. It's it's right here. It's just like, hey, Dr. Goon, there's a whole world under the surface of that ocean if you would just open your eyes, if you would just go beneath the surface and see it and experience it. So what must we do to position ourselves for that kind of connection and revelation? We want it. What is standing in your way? Is there anger? Is there unforgiveness? Is there a secret sin? Is there something that's blocking you? Is it a lack of holiness or consecration in your life? Is it a half-hearted pursuit? You want the things of the Lord and the kingdom, but you want the things of the world too. That never works. 
When I received Christ, I had two boyfriends at the same time. <laughs> and they both proposed on the same day. Now, they weren't boyfriends. They, for me, you know, I miss my brothers. I used to wrestle and fight, and we knock each other's teeth out and stuff. They're, they were brothers to me, but to them, I was their girlfriend. And I, I, I was 18. I didn't quite get it until the rings came out, you know? They didn't know about each other, fortunately. Because I had been transferred from one base to the other, and the other hadn't caught up yet. <laughs> but I get saved, and I'm in love with Jesus now. And so I had to, like, I prayed. I go, God, which one? And he said, neither. Will you lay them down? I've had four proposals now. And I'm still very happily single. <laughs> I'm very happy single. I am a happy single. I fell in love with this Jew, this rich Jew named Jesus. <laughs> and guys, I know you're looking good, but you just don't compare. <laughs> Keep trying. No, and the last two, <laughs> it was over missions. I said, this is a non-negotiable for me. You know, you get married, there's things of your single life you need to leave behind. And then the two need to become one. But missions, spreading the word of God through the nations was a non-negotiable for me. And both of the guys, these are different times, the latter two. We're not at the same time. <laughs> yes, I want to be a missionary. Last time I was just starting in Mozambique about 22 years ago. Yes, let's go, let's get married. I go, you better come and see it first. Because you say Africa to Americans, and they're thinking Tarzan and Jane, right? I was working on a garbage dump at the time. It was so filthy, you had to talk with your teeth closed or the flies would get in because they're thirsty. It was filthy. And he came, and we were rushed for time. He came on an outreach, and um, after a few days, he goes, I can't do this. If you won't lay this down, wedding's off. And I gave him on a, a kiss on the cheek, and I said goodbye. <laughs> it was a very ambivalent breakup. You know, I, you know I, I go, I'd be a terrible American wife. I'd be a husband beater. I just know it. <laughs> so, I know me. So go home, go find a good American wife. It was two weeks before the wedding. Invitations were out, dress was bought, the venue, the whole bit. Kind of embarrassing. I gave up this guy for a garbage dump. <laughs> he was a really good guy, too. <laughs> he loved the Lord. But nothing compares to Jesus. Nothing. I can't let that go or his call. I can't, I can't make those compromises. I'm not saying marriage is a compromise, but it, he had called me to something. And career meant nothing anymore. And marriage meant nothing anymore if it, if it would pull me out of my lane. I want to please him. I am just obsessed with wanting to please him with obedience. Jesus said, how do you, how do you measure love? He says, if you love me, you'll obey me. Love is spelled O-B-E-Y. I want to obey him. I want to go wherever he goes.
light momentary afflictions, letting go of little things in comparison to he is worthy. <laughs> and I just, I struggle because I don't even think there's words in the English language that can explain what is happening here. Yeah. I think language fails me. So I have heard his world mandate and I've embraced it as my own. What is your world mandate? If he's called you to go, are you preparing yourself to go? If he's called you to stay, are you praying and supporting those who will go? Maybe your world is your street, your next door neighbor, or your classroom, or your workplace. Are you bringing Christ there? And yes, you will suffer sometimes a bit of rejection. It's nothing what Paul went through. And when you see him, when you experience him, when you feel his good favor upon your life, it doesn't matter what it costs anymore. When I would go into China and take, I would take Bibles there and meet these awesome Christians in the underground church, and they wouldn't even call themselves a Christian until they had suffered for the cause of Christ. And then when they were arrested or went to jail or got beaten up or something, they would come into these meetings and they would say, praise God, I was counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. Now I can call myself a Christian because they were judging by the fruit of their lives. Remember when, when John the Baptist says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It's not just words. Our, our life, our actions have to back it up. They have to demonstrate it. And then when you see and experience Jesus for who he is in those different ways. We begin to see others differently, too. When I went to this dump, there's like 20,000 people living on the dump. It was horrific. And my first day there, the stench and, and the smoke and the flies, dead bodies on the dump, rotting. And this little boy, this toddler, comes up to me with his arms open wide, and he's got lice and scabies and green snot streaming out of his nose and a big belly full of parasites, and he wants a hug. And I am going like, God, get me out of here. I don't even like normal kids. Right? <laughs> because I was seeing the snot and the flies and the lice and the scabies. But as he got close and I looked into his eyes, I saw Jesus there. I saw Jesus looking up at me. It's like Jesus just opened up a new faculty, a new means of, 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 of perceiving, and I, I saw a child dearly loved by God. And, and the verse in Matthew 25, this is when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was a prisoner, you came to visit me. When I was sick, you looked after me. When you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. That is gospel too. The good news isn't just that when you die, you go to heaven. It's good news today. And the whole context of that chapter is about the kingdom of God. Enter now into the kingdom of God prepared for you from the foundations of the earth. Jesus is inviting us into something, into his purposes and plans, into his world mandate. And it only cost us leaving behind the worldly mandate that might look really good to you. Marriage is a good thing. College, your degree is a good thing. But if it's competing with his call on your life, then it's a bad thing. It's a distracting thing. It's a rival affection. He's given us an opportunity to join our hearts and hands with his and to jump into exploits that have eternal significance. And as we do this, we get closer to Jesus and his purposes and plans that we get to participate in. It's an invitation. We begin to experience him in new ways. 
I have no regrets about going overseas or being a hostage or being beaten up or having malaria. I have found Jesus once my first day overseas on that dump. I got food poisoning. I'm puking my guts out. I'm puking and pooping in a bucket. And I'm going like, oh, I wish I were a home. I miss the air-conditioned church and my soft seats and the great worship. And the Lord just spoke to me and says, well, can't you worship me now? And I go like, oh, I have an opportunity to render a sacrifice of praise. So I began to praise the Lord, and I throw up and praise the Lord and throw up. Well, he didn't heal me that night. I puked all night, but by morning, I was so aware of his presence. I go, God, I'd rather be sick like this for the rest of my life and know you like this than be well without this awareness. God's really big. The whole universe, the mere outskirts of his ways. And our capacity here, if we will let him grow it, he will fill us with himself, with his own spirit. You'll see those miracles. You'll experience those miracles in your own body, in your own life. What would you trade for that? What's he calling you to? What's he inviting you to? What will you say yes to? What will it cost? You know what it cost? It only cost everything. That's all. And once you just let it go, you have everything of him. Amen. Well, stand up. Let's pray. Jimmy. Jesus, I want more. You have so blessed me. Yes. In my pilgrimage with you, you have so blessed me. And all I want is more. It's just something that, it's like the more you reveal yourself to my heart and enlarge my heart, that's the more I want. And there's nothing else I want besides you. For all of us here, Lord, I pray that you give us those divine encounters with you those treasures that, that come from heaven. Those opportunities to, like Paul, rejoice even in the difficult times. Because we feel your presence with us in those times, just like what well, you guys think of Stephen when they were stoning him to death. He didn't pick up those rocks and throw them back. He didn't curse them. He fixed his eyes on Jesus. And when we do that, the nature and character of Jesus comes right into us. And he goes, oh, Jesus, forgive them. Don't hold this offense against them. When we see him as he is, it transforms us. And we willingly let go even of our life. Father, I pray that for each one here tonight. That we, that October 8th just isn't a defining moment for those that came up here tonight to be sent out as missionaries, but a defining moment for us when we connect with you in a certain way, in a, a way that causes us to freely receive and freely give, whether we take it home with us tonight or to our workplace or our classrooms or whether we revisit that, that call you placed on our life some time ago, that nation, that people group,